And I'd like to welcome you to the very first IORMA webinar on the subject of immersive technologies. I'm delighted to be um, hosting uh, this event. And we're going to start by just sharing a little bit of information about ourselves individually. And I'll do this in the form of some presentation slides. So this is me, I'm David Wortley. I'm a CEO and founder of 360 and 360 Immersive Experiences. I'm also a member of the advisory board of uh, IORMA. Uh, I've been working with uh, webinars and virtual conferences, um, web conferencing for about 20 years, um, but this is my first webinar for a couple of years, so I may be a little bit ring rusty. Uh, but just to tell you a little bit um, uh, about um, what I do, uh, my interests are primarily in 360 degree images and videos. So in other words, taking photographs and videos of real world environments um, in 360 degrees, which uh, I, the way I describe it provides opportunities to help people to travel through space and time. I'm a Google Street View Trusted Pro with uh, over 21,000 published images, and these images have been viewed 82 million times in total um, and the kind of uh, images and videos that I uh, capture can be used for multiple applications. Uh, I'm also involved in the creation of virtual tours and events and the image that you see on the screen there is a screenshot from Guijian International General Hospital when they had their launch event back in uh, October um, fortunately, I travelled through Wuhan before the uh, coronavirus uh, situation uh, happened, so uh, I wasn't uh, a victim of it. Uh, so that is me. Uh, I'm going to go invite each of the presenters in turn now to uh, share their experiences. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Ross Edwards. Uh, Ross is um, a, a director of, he's the director of immersive technologies at IORMA. Um, and he supplied me with this graphic uh, to show some of his commercial interests involved with uh, immersive technologies. So what I'm going to do uh, now um, is to uh, unmute Ross and uh, spotlight him and ask him to say something about himself. Hi. Um, yes, I say my name is Ross Edwards and uh, as well as being an uh, immersive technologies director, um, I am one of the co-founders of um, uh, ImageScope Productions. Uh, we're basically, we've got a background in CGI and feature films. Um, so that has led us quite uh, naturally to doing digital environments for um, VR projects. Um, we've got a number of VR projects on the go at the moment. Um, we've got one which is a, a TV series. Um, and also we've worked on a project with our exposure therapists helping people showing signs of PTSD from car accidents. Um, we've also got another project with a, a forest in France to, to do a flyover with that. Um, yeah, one of our aims is, is looking at optimization of, of virtual reality uh, using um, gaming engines and just seeing what is the, the, the highest quality we can get out of that um, and to, for virtual reality projects. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ross. Um, I'm now going to go back to um, uh, sharing uh, screens and I'm going to introduce uh, James uh, Watson. Uh, James um, is the marketing uh, director at a company called uh, Immerse. Um, they have a, a very prestigious uh, client base and this is, uh, shows you the logos of some of the clients that they uh, work with. Uh, he'll tell you more in more detail about uh, what he does and what Immerse do. Um, and in particular, he's going to tell you a little bit about their virtual enterprise uh, uh, platform. Uh, so uh, I'm going to now unmute um, James um, and hand over to you. Thanks very much, David. Um, yes, as David says, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at company called Immerse. Uh, we have been in the immersive technology space for 
past four, nearly five years now, when the first sort of half decent virtual reality headset came out in the Oculus DK1, that's when um, we saw the opportunity. Before that, we were kind of desk-based um, learning and development. So you could argue it was a natural progression to move into virtual reality, although back then it was quite a bold move. Um, we were very early to the market, which uh, is now looking like a um, amazing visionary decision. Uh, but over a period of four years, there have been some times where we were probably thinking perhaps we were too far ahead. But we've spent the last four years, in effect, developing a, a platform uh, which enables large organizations to do a number of things. Uh, in effect, it, it's, you know, the way simplistic you look at it, it helps them operationalize uh, virtual reality content. Specifically, at the moment, training, because training is the... Um, best understood and clearest sort of use case of, uh, of virtual reality from a sort of enterprise perspective. And our platform enables uh, the companies such as Shell, DHL, uh, we've got a, a good uh, project also with GE Healthcare, which uh, fits David a little bit with your, some of your photography out in Wuhan of the uh, MRI scanner. And it, we enable companies to either create content using our platform, or take existing content and then use the platform in effect to deploy their content, um, to scale it across a large organization, and most importantly, to measure it. So the way I look at it is, you know, we have a platform that really takes virtual reality content from being kind of an outlier piece of content that might sit outside a, a large organization's um, learning ecosystem and you can actually bring it into the ecosystem. You can integrate our platform with a learning management system or, or other systems, and suddenly you have something that is far more uh, operationally sound and easy to measure. So we've done that for, as I said, Shell, for GE Healthcare, DHL. We've got a number of other large clients um, in progress that I can't specifically name check, but it's a very interesting time to be in the immersive technology space, and. Um, it's moving very quickly and it's very exciting. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for that, uh, Jane. So we're now going to um, uh, move on to our next presenter. Uh, here's Steve Dunn. Um, uh, Steve has a number of different hats on. Um, he's probably one of the most qualified people of uh, all our panelists um, in terms of the work that he's done with virtual and augmented reality. Um, he's a co-founder of a company called Medical Realities with a famous virtual sur sur surgeon, Shafi Ahmed. Um, so when it comes to uh, medical application, uh, Steve has got an awful lot to be able to uh, share with us. So I'm now going to ask Steve to uh, talk about himself. Great. Uh Thank you, David. Uh, very nice introduction. Um, I've been in uh, immersive and augmented uh, space for uh, quite a long time now. It started off with augmented reality about uh, 12 years ago and virtual reality about uh, eight years ago. Um, I have a couple of companies in that space, uh, Amplified Robot, but more importantly, uh, medical realities. And medical realities, I started off with uh, Professor Shafi Ahmed, who's a renowned uh, virtual surgeon. Um, uh, and we, we actually use uh, immersive technology to train and educate um, medical students, but also healthcare professionals all around the world. Um, it's an exciting time to be in this area. Um, and uh, we're seeing a huge growth. We've been doing it now in medical realities for over three and a half years, uh, but right now it's just beginning to take off in a big way. Uh, so that's all I have to say about medical realities, except it's an exciting area to be in. Immersive technology is certainly part of the future for everybody. Okay, thank you very much for uh, that, Steve. Um, going back to um, our uh, presentation, um, our next uh, presenter is, uh, well, I, he's one of the, the um, most renowned futurists that I, that I know of. He's the CEO and founder of uh, Fast uh, Future, known Rohit for a number of years. Um, and he really has uh, pioneered um, and really brought out the profile of um, 
uh, being a futurist and the impact of technology on the future of business and society. Um, just to give you a little bit of a heads up on one of the events that uh, Rohit is involved in organizing, which is Fast Futures London Futures Week, due in um, uh, July. I will be showing this uh, screen again uh, at the end of the presentation, just to remind you. Uh, but for those of you who are interested in coming along to this event, it's going to be a very worthwhile use of your time. So I'm now going to uh, unmute Rohit um, and ask him to tell us about himself. So. Hi, well, I think David's uh, already been very generous in explaining who I am. Uh, David was actually very kind enough to be a contributor to our first book on the future of business. Uh, I'm a global futurist. I work with clients around the world, um, virtually right now. Uh, helping them think about what are the forces and factors that could shape the future and how do you create strategies to both respond to what might be coming but also to create your own preferred future. And we do that through a mixture of speaking, executive education, research, consultancy and publishing. And one of the areas that people are getting very excited about at the moment is this whole area of immersive technologies and how do we use them to enhance the way we teach internally and we, we accelerate our learning how do we use it to engage customers in different ways and how do we create new experiences that we've never heard imagined before so we've been doing quite a lot of work with the likes of aruba and huawei talking about uh, in particular 5g and how that enables different possible immersive experiences in the future with these technologies whether it's in a football stadium or a live concert or a number of other settings and so we've published various bits of work research on that uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say on this uh, panel. Okay thank you very much for that uh, uh, Rohit. Uh, so we're now going to go into the uh, question time um, and uh, we'll have a look at our first question um, and the first question that we uh, have for our panelists um, is about um, what the definition of immersive technologies is. So to answer this, um, I'm going to ask uh, Ross, I'm going to unmute him and ask him, what, so what's your definition of uh, immersive uh, technologies, uh, Ross? Um, well, I think it's, it's any immersive technology that helps um, extend well it extends or creates new realities uh, for you um, and also looking at uh, sort of haptics as well in that it can be all your senses um, that it can it can experience um, particularly regarding sort of virtual reality um, i think it's when your peripheral vision is involved in 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 that um, rather than just seeing a 2d screen i think it's a very powerful uh, space for, uh, say, training or um, learning different things. Um, yeah, I think it is because the peripheral vision um, occurs outside of the point of fixation, which is your, your normal straight vision. Um, I think it's, yeah, it brings a lot of power to that environment. So I think that would be my, my take on it, really. Okay, um, so thank you very much for, for that. Um, I, I guess the question that I, that I have um, is, do we actually need uh, technology to, um, to become immersive? You know, I mean, there's an argument that would say that uh, books are a form of immersive technology. Radio and cinema are a form of immersive technology because they create environments in which uh, people can uh, immerse themselves and become totally uh, engaged. So what contribution does uh, technology, today's technology, make to immersion? James, can I um, bring you in and, and ask you to have your views on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's probably a distinction there with what you're talking about, David, from, you know, immersing yourself through any different kind of mean. Um, and yes, you could be, you could find a book incredibly immersive. Mentally, that's very immersive. You imagine the characters, you imagine the scenes, you know, and often that's, um, 
arguably more immersive than when you're sitting and watching a film because you know you're not having to do the thinking so i think there's different levels you know that a book is certainly not technology uh, it's certainly a way to immerse yourself mentally in a different world um, but i think the distinction there being you know when you have technology to I would say enhance um, levels of immersion. You know, if you are, um, you know, particularly, uh, you know, my, my field being VR, yes, you are completely immersed, you are completely focused, you're completely, um, you know, uh, completely bought into that environment. And it's very powerful because of that, particularly in a training environment, because you are absolutely 100% focused. You're not getting distracted by text. You're not getting a colleague offering you a, a nice cup of tea whilst you're midway through a, a training exercise. You are completely and utterly bought into that environment. So, you know, do you need technology for immersion? No, but are there certain things that through technology make them more effective, more immersive, um, more impactful? then absolutely. So, you know, there's a differentiator there. It's not, technology doesn't have, uh, you know, the, the sole rights to immersion, absolutely not. But there are certain things, be that VR, AR, MR, that do heighten the level of immersion. Yeah, that's a good answer. So essentially, if I, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying um, is that the technology can enable a sense of immersion, particularly if you've got a, something like a virtual reality headset on, um, then that actually enhances or almost forces you to become in an immersive environment. I'm going to bring in um, uh, Steve now and uh, ask for, for his thoughts on, on that. Yes, I think uh, virtual reality especially, um, uh, immersion uh, in virtual reality can be total immersion in a way because it's not only visual, uh, but it's also sound and it's also tactile as well so that uh, by using all those things one can actually sort of create something which is indistinguishable from the real thing um, and by creating that and by teaching people uh, an immersive technology where they where you have can have a lot of interactivity uh, that really helps in the education process um, and also the learning process and and actually feeling part of what's going on we live in a three-dimensional world uh, we should be taught and educated in three dimensions as well i think okay so uh, essentially it really enhances uh, many of the practices that we have in everyday life. Um, I, I'm just going to bring in uh, Rohit now and ask him if he would like to make any comments about that. Um, sorry, I was just answering a question from one of your participants. Um, but uh, I mean, I think I've heard, you know, what everyone said is great. I think the, the reality here is that we can create incredible experiences around education, around entertainment, around how you build dialogue between communities and how you create shared experiences so you don't have to leave your desktop but you can be in a shared experience visiting a new factory location with your colleagues from all around the world but never have to be there. Also once we start to build in AI and, and in the same way as in gaming environments you have the environments generate themselves we can start to create virtual worlds that actually use AI to uh, generate themselves. So the immersive experience unfolds in, in a different way for each participant. So I think there's some very exciting things we can do there. The question is always gonna be, how do we make it accessible in a cheap and easily uh, deliverable format? How do we make it accessible to the mass market? And how do we convince people that they want to use this? And is that going to be something they buy separately or is it something that just gets embedded in their device and is another app on their device they start to access? There's some, some very interesting questions open up when we start to see the kind of true potential unfold of the technologies. Mm. Yes, I, I think you made some good points there and we'll have a chance to discuss those in a bit more detail when we look at the role of, of AI and other technologies um, in the process. I'm now going to go back to, uh, to Steve again um, and, and ask him if he could help us with uh, explaining what the difference between VR, AR and um, uh, MR is. Thanks, David. I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll start off with uh, the easy bit first, which is VR or virtual reality. Um, that's where I asked you to put on uh, a head-mounted display 
uh, some goggles, uh, in which I just take over everything that you can see. So virtual reality, I'm actually uh, transposing uh, your real world into a totally virtual world. You can't see anything else. Uh, you possibly can't hear anything else as well. So you're totally involved and totally immersed in what's going on. Uh, slightly contentious when we get on to AR and augmented reality and MR and mixed reality. Augmented reality uh, essentially is where I ask you to look at uh, uh, the real world and that could be asking you to look through your smartphone, your tablet or uh, a visor like the HoloLens or Magic Leap. Uh, you essentially you're looking, still looking at the real world, uh, but I'm overlaying images. It could be animations or graphics, but the word is overlay. So that's augmented reality. You can actually uh, manipulate those images around, but they're overlaid onto the, what, the, the real world view that you can see. Now, mixed reality is in actual fact mashing the two things together, where what I'm actually adding to the real world view uh, is in fact, um, looks as though it's totally integrated into that view. So it's not just an overlay, it actually can be something which could look as though it's actually integrated with inside the view you're seeing. So if something should be uh, behind something else in what you're looking at, it will appear occluded and behind that uh, what you're watching. So that's the, the, the real differences between everything. Virtual reality is where everything you see is you're totally immersed in it, you can't see anything else. Augmented reality is where you can see the real world, but there's an overlay um, or overlays onto that real world. A mixed reality is trying to make it indistinguishable by adding new things into the real world environment. Uh, and again, that could be animations or anything that you want to do. Uh, so those are the real differences between uh, VR, AR and uh, mixed reality. We'll move on to the, the next uh, uh, question, um, and that is um, what immersive technologies do you use um, or develop within your own organization? So now I'm going to hand over to uh, James and ask him to talk about what you do in Immerse. Thanks. So, I mean, I, I've talked a little bit about it previously. I mean, we are we're solely focused on virtual reality and that is uh, not to say there aren't huge there's a huge value across particularly uh, augmented reality in the sort of training space as well but you know ultimately it's about doing something as best as you can and not trying to do any number of different um technologies so we focus on virtual reality and i think interesting there's there's a role for both within training you know you have Virtual reality is, as Steve was saying, you are completely closed off in a, a virtual world and your focus is very high. You can pretty much do anything. You can recreate an oil rig, you can recreate uh, an MRI scanner room, you can do whatever you want and you can create whatever scenario you want in that. So that is hugely powerful where you want to put someone in an environment where they have to be solely focused on that and doing whatever training. But then augmented, augmented reality has a great uh, impact as well. But for augmented reality, the, the key thing there is you need the real world. You know, that's, if you really want to differentiate VR and AR or MR, you need the real world for AR and MR. You need something to overlay onto, and that invariably would be, you know, a real environment, whereas VR, create whatever you want. So I think that's an interesting distinction to look at. Um, but I mean, so if you want to be, <clears throat> for example, training someone on the job you know they, they're a recent uh, starter and they have a big piece of machinery that they need to uh, work with well that's perfect if you're able to bring in some sort of uh, augmented reality headset and overlay data onto that machine brilliant you know that's really good but if you want to train that person from zero knowledge you probably don't want to have them out on the factory floor, floor looking at an expensive piece of kit that you potentially have to take offline in order to train them on and there is always the question they do something wrong so you take that piece of kit, you create it in virtual reality, they can do whatever they want with it, they can repeat the training as often they want, it's all measured, every action is, is then reported. So you know, that's an interesting distinction. They have complementary roles to play, um, and we've decided to focus on, on that virtual reality piece pretty much uh, at the front end. And it gives you a huge amount of scope, as I said. You, you know, we have customers come to us, big global organizations, say, well, what scenarios can you create and what can you measure? You can create anything. You can create a, 
once in 20 year incident um, to train someone on. You know, you can um, blow things up. You can, you know, put people in situations that, you know, that once in 20 years where they may experience it, they can have gone through that 20 times. You know, it isn't the real world, but, you know, as was mentioned previously with haptics and other sensory uh, elements, it's real enough. It's real enough to stress test people. So, you know, from that perspective, it's very, very powerful. Um, I think Steve mentioned earlier about it's an exciting time to be in, in immersive technology because the market does now understand the power of all the different sort of uh, uh, technologies within immersive technology. And so they're really looking very hard at these technologies. Um, and there's definitely been, uh, I joined Immerse just over a year ago. And in that time, I've seen the market shift. When I first joined, it was a little bit difficult for us to be talking about platform and scale and measurement because a lot of people were still thinking, I'm not really sure this VR technology is going to stick around. You know, it may just be a little bit of a fad. It's a, is it 3D TV type thing? And will it, will it stick around? Those conversations have shifted, you know, and I'm sure, you know, Rohit, Ross and, and Steve as well, you, you, you get a sense for there is a, the market hasn't matured, but the market is starting to understand more what the technology can do, which really has meant uh, from our perspective, having, as I said, been a little, too far out front for a while, um, we're seeing there's a move away from why should I consider these technologies to how do I use them? How do I implement them? How yes. do I measure them? Which are all the kind of conversations that very much fit with, with what our, our proposition is. So, yes. you know, it's, it's a good time to be in that space and to be having those discussions with, you know, some of these big organizations who are considering it very seriously now. Yeah, so when, when you're looking at the kind of technologies that uh, your clients need to use, experience, you're, you're primarily talking about, as far as Immersa are concerned, uh, you're primarily talking about virtual reality uh, headsets to get the full value from the experience. Uh, but it's also, I believe that it's possible that a lot of your applications can be um, accessed on a desktop uh, computer, so you can have uh, mixed uh, environments. I'm going to um, I'm going to go over to uh, to Steve now because um, I want to ask uh, Steve a little bit about um, the work that uh, Shafi Ahmed does uh, and the, and the use his use of virtual reality. Perhaps you'd like to tell us um, you know a little bit about Shafi and uh, some of the operations that he's performed. Um, well, in in reality or virtual reality, how would you describe it? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, in a Actual fact, uh, what, one of the, the, the best things that uh, happened in the last two years was my actually sort of meeting Shafi. Uh, he and I actually got together at a, a conference uh, to Google campus um, and I'd seen he'd been actually experimenting with uh, Google Glass. I don't know if everybody remembers the all fated Google Glass um, because um, a part of his job was that he was a training surgeon. Uh, he had 300 students under his wing at the Royal London Hospital, but he could only actually teach uh, on, almost on a one-to-one -one basis. He could only have two students uh, actually attend any of his operations that he was doing. Um, and we were trying to devise a way about how we could use new technology and immersive technology. Uh, we've been working in, uh, I've been working in virtual reality and suggested that we actually start to uh, initially film some of his uh, operations in 360 and then show them to the students uh, using um, uh, the new uh, head mounted dis displays that were coming out. Um, and I have to say that um, all 300 students were just blown away by what, uh, what they saw and how they could actually hear what was going on, but actually see what was going on properly for the first time. And of course, one of the things in training and education especially is uh, how do you scale these things? And Shafi's always been interested about how, how you can scale things, how he can actually share his knowledge and, uh, and, and his teaching with as many people as possible. Um, and to that end, uh, we've actually sort of done live streaming of his operations where we've interacted with students from around the world. Uh, I think the top uh, range that we've got to so far 
is that we've had 55,000 people around the world actually watching one of his live operations. So we're continually looking for ways in which, uh, uh, and Shafi's continually looking for ways in which he can use these new, new types of technology to expand what he does, but also to enable to help other people that are in this country and around the world uh, actually get part of, part of his knowledge. Um, we're doing it mainly in virtual reality now. We're adding simulations in, into it so that uh, students and surgeons can, can actually try out certain techniques as well without actually getting near a real patient. Um, uh, it's interesting that uh, pilots um, uh, uh, have been working with simulation for a long time um, and pilots have to take six simulation courses per year but uh, in something like uh, um, uh, surgery for instance uh, surgeons aren't required to take uh, any any more courses after they've actually graduated and got to consultant basis we actually want to get everybody involved so they can keep on learning, keep on understanding about the new things that are happening in surgery and medicine as a whole. And uh, virtual reality is a fantastic way of actually ca capturing this and also being able to scale it up and make it available to, to everybody. We want to democratize uh, medical training and education. And that's one of the things that Shaf is really, really uh, enthusiastic about. Uh, we're now experimenting using AR as well. AR can be very useful when you want to do collaborative work, uh, especially collaborative work with people who are not in the same uh, hospital as you, perhaps not even in the same city or not even in the same country, but from around the world. Um, and that's proving sort of very interesting. Uh, and in fact, there's, there's just been a, a, a new thing we've been doing um, uh, with a company in America, which is testing out this possibility of collaboration using AR. So we've got virtual reality for training and education and disseminating the, the training and education all around the world and, and taking it to people rather than people having to come to a training center or to a hospital or to university, they can actually be trained and educated wherever they are. Um, so th this is the type of thing that both Shafi and I are really interested in promoting. Um, we see that immersive technology, as it gets better, uh, one of the barriers up until now, uh, yes, I, I said that the, the pain of some of the other panelists and James uh, of in actual fact, were we too early into the market in virtual reality? But I think that you have to get in at some time and actually, you know, plant your your, your flag in the ground and, and make a statement. And we're now actually seeing uh, people sort of catching on to how good and useful this can be. Uh, it's an amalgamation of is the software getting better and is the hardware getting better? And the answer is yes. And as they keep on getting better, then we're going to get more and more people interested in what we're doing, what everybody else is doing in immersive technology. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Steve. I'm, I'm now going to go over to uh, to Rohit, um, and I, I, I'm going to ask Rohit about some of the uh, other disruptive technologies that are uh, becoming relevant uh, to immersive technologies, uh, technologies like AI and chatbots. You did um, kind of allude to the ability of AI to create uh, environments and maybe even create personalized immersive environments for, for different people. Would you like to share some of your thoughts on, um, on how these technologies are going to impact in the future? Yeah, I think the uh, we're going to see it impact in a number of ways. The first is for the developers themselves, that uh, as we build up a bigger and bigger body of knowledge, the developers about how to do certain things, how to render environments, how to create certain effects, how to deliver different types of experiences, whether you're teaching a mechanic, you know, how to replace a head gasket, or a surgeon about how to hold a particular tool when doing an operation. We can do an awful lot of learning about hand movements, about all those sorts of things, about the physical mechanics of the human body in these situations, the behavior of uh, other people in these situations, which can then be turned into assets, you know, using machine learning that you can then draw on and use and accelerate your development. So you could start to see the development of augmented and virtual reality really 
increasingly becoming a process of assembling lots of different assets for lots of different features that you want to create in your environment a bit like you know you, you, you see now with modern software development so that's that's one thing the tools will start to help us develop more uh, secondly we'll start to see AI being used within the environments as I suggested so that you'll be dynamically generating more and more of the experience we'll be able to monitor for example what we look at what we engage with as an individual and start to realize that there's maybe 60 percent of the the virtual environment that i'm not exploring uh, but where do i focus my attention where do i i get interested where do i interact and then using that to adapt what's created for me and what's rendered for me or where do i seem to hesitate more using just behavioral monitoring as a, as a doctor again, going in to do an operation, where is it I seem most hesitant to take the next step? And then using the understanding of my behavior to bring in additional content. This is okay, you, you always seem to hesitate at this point or you're hesitating at this point, maybe it's making an incision, maybe it's uh, about suturing technique. Let us give you something else. It's almost like a video inserted into that because we think this is an area you have a learning issue with so that we can overlay additional content for you. And so AI really starting to understand our behavior. Uh, when we get to the point where we've got AIs that are really managing our lives on our devices, understanding our behavior, making choices, communicating, buying, uh, doing all that kind of stuff, then you could have our personal AI interacting with the AI in the VR environment or the AR environment or the mixed reality environment and actually communicating behind the scenes about our needs, our interests, our preferences. And so without me even saying it, you might start to see members of my family being rendered into the environment or food that I like being shown in that environment, doing things that make it more and more comfortable for me. Now, partly that could be just to make gaming more fun. It could be made to make entertainment more fun but where i think this is going to be really really important is in recovery situations for people who uh you know have had an accident or children who are suffering from some sort of learning disability the more we can put people at their ease the more we can put things that are familiar to them back into the environment where they're learning and rehabilitating the faster the rehabilitation can be and that's very hard to get from the individual for them to say, here are all the things you can put into my environment. But actually, if we've got an AI that knows us, it can start to communicate that to the devices we're working with. Now, this isn't going to happen this year or next year, but within about three years, you'll start to see enough of the technology in our phones acting like that personal AI and being able to communicate certain things to other applications. And then it's whether the app developers can tap into that and use it to create these hyper-personalized environments within AR, VR, or mixed reality. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great uh, answer. Um, yes, one, one of the things that I've come across recently that I'm particularly interested in in this space um, is to do with conditions like uh, dementia and stress management. Uh, you can imagine scenarios where people are wearing a virtual reality headset and they're immersed, say if you're suffering from stress, they're immersed in a relaxing environment with nice pleasant sounds and you can see how if you've got wearable devices that measure your pulse rate, um, your level of uh, stress, your blood pressure uh, and feed that back into the experience, uh, the experience can be modified so you have the most relaxing environment that is personalized to, uh, to you. Um, I, I just, uh, uh, before I move on to, uh, to, to Ross again, I'll just um, uh, bring in uh, James again and just ask him, uh, because I, I know that some of your applications, uh, one of the, the main uh, strengths of them is that um, you, you can monitor people's actions and as um, Rohit was saying there, you can understand where they're struggling with learning activities. Do you want to just uh, say uh, a few things about that? Yeah, uh, and actually just to pick up on Rohit's point there around that, the, the eye tracking piece. I mean, that, uh, and that's, I don't, 
that exists now. Uh, some of the headsets, you have the ability within the VR environment to track exactly, you know, not only what they're doing, but where they're looking, which is hugely powerful, as you say. I think what will really unlock lock the potential there is, and it's a much overused and referred to term, but 5G, because what you will be able to do then, as you mentioned, Rohit, is, you know, based on how someone is reacting in that environment, where they're looking, what they've done, you can suddenly tailor that environment to exactly you know, what is going to work for them. So what you might find is a, a trainee might be looking in a certain direction and missing a key cue. Okay, well, based on that, therefore, the next stage, you may change things around so that that cue is in a different place or is highlighted in a different way. And then what you might learn from that is, okay, this person's more of a visual person or this person is more based around sound or, you know, you start to understand that individual better. So, you know, the ability to change those environments is somewhat dependent on processing power and therefore, you know, 5G unlocks it. So I think that's, um, that's a, an interesting um, point to talk about. And what you can do is then measure everything, um, literally, within a virtual environment. We track uh, 30 data points per second per user, which is a vast amount of data. It actually is, can be sort of scare people almost, but in effect, you decide what is of value to you, what you want to extract, what outcomes you take from that you know is it a question of someone completing points one through to eight in a certain amount of time that means success or is it they need to create uh, they need to achieve three out of four of those milestones you can interpret it in however you want but that data is incredibly powerful um, and so the ability to track the ability to therefore you know start demonstrating return on investment um, start demonstrating the efficacy of these, you know, that is the key. I think, you know, Steve, we were agreeing that there's a sort of slight sort of point where things are really starting to progress. The data is, you know, it's, it's data and having the use cases and saying, you know, from a medical perspective, there were outcomes were 5% better based on this, that and the other. There's a really good study, Steve, that you've probably seen, uh, which I think Oculus commissioned, but it was with Imperial, no, Imperial College ran it and they basically were, they trained um, medical students uh, half in VR, half traditional methods. And then they watched them conduct, um, conduct a, an operation uh, using uh, prosthetics. And the, the students who had been trained using VR needed no intervention from uh, an attendee to help them, whereas 83% of those who trained in normal methods needed some sort of help. And that's, I mean, that, those sorts of, that data, which there isn't enough of, is priceless, you know, because yeah. then it takes it away from, yeah, I feel I'm better equipped to do my job because you've just tried some cool tech to 80, you know, 0% of those trained in VR needed, uh, needed, um, needed uh, assistance. So those, you know, we've got, you know, we have a big project with Shell. They're rolling out eight health and safety um, modules. The data from that is going to take a long time, not only to develop, but also to get permission to share it. So there's lots of data out there, but it's just um, actually getting into the public domain. And that's going to fast forward the whole immersive tech sector quicker than anything uh, anyone else will, uh, will be able to do. Okay, Jade, thank you very much for that. Um, we, we've got about uh, 10 or 15 minutes left, and we've still got a few questions to answer. So I'm going to roll a few of these two together now. Um, and I'm going, to, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask Ross if he would uh, just share with, uh, his thoughts on the opportunities and, and challenges that are uh, likely to be either faced by immersive technologies or posed to business over the next five years? Um, yes, I, th I think, yes, there obviously are a lot of opportunities coming up. I think one of the, the interesting areas is, is multi-users um, in, in the VR environment, being able to work together with people in, in different places. Uh, we've been working on uh, a project with architects, and um, I mean, there's, there's a few of these around now, but uh, being able to um, have an architect in New York, London, wherever, be standing in the same sort of location and being able to sit inside a property which has, has only been on, on plans and being able to move things around and make adjustments and working with clients. Um, 
and also I'd say with, with meetings as well, I think multi-user um, experiences will be uh, a big opportunity. Um, I know it's been mentioned before, but yeah, the 5G and that and making, um, yeah, sort of mobile, making, it's also, I think there is a issue with, with VR at the moment. You've got uh, different types of VR. You've got tethered VR, uh, where you need quite powerful computers. Then you've got some mobile VR, where that's obviously can be, um, a lot more people can access that straight away. Um, so I think that the quality of everything, we're, we're optimizing um, VR um, apps and such like, the quality of the apps will, will improve um, substantially. Um, yeah, over the coming years. And also going back to what um, James and Rohit were saying about AI, uh, that, that's going to be a, a really big um, opportunity as well. I think that's going to have big changes in, in for, for VR. In the game engines we're working in, it already implements AI in there. And so much of this is driven by the game engines and the gaming sort of sector. Um, and the games using a lot of AI already. So it doesn't take that much to be able to implement that in VR and being more responsive to, to people and, and their environments. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of uh, sort of, in, in, with the investment and I see a lot of people sort of investing a lot of money into it, but uh, yeah, it's getting commercial viable um, products out there. Um, I mean, someone told me recently with investors about there's a, a lot of really clever stuff which is being made out there, but a lot of it is they're finding it hard to find applications for it in, in, the, in the marketplace. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think it's, there's it's quite a lot of challenges out there. Um, obviously, with the VR, it's, it's getting, yeah, it does rely on headsets, so people having access to that or if you're location-based, then it's a matter of obviously people having to go to that place as well. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Ross. Um, I, as, as we're uh, we're uh, closing in on the um, the finish time for the uh, for this uh, webinar, uh, I just want to go to over to Steve because Steve's um, been uh, responsible for organising quite a lot of um, meetup events uh, in London. Uh, on the subject of um, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. So, Steve, where, where would you advise people to look if they wanted to learn more about immersive technologies? Well, thanks, David. Um, yeah, yeah, you actually set it up for me. Um, augmenting reality is my meetup group. Um, if you Google that, uh, you'll get straight to us. We've got nearly 7,000 members in the group already, which is fantastic. And we're getting more and more every, every day. When we started off, we, uh, we started off with about uh, nine members. Uh, that was uh, seven years ago. Uh, so you can see how things are progressing. Uh, it, it's becoming more and more of an interesting space for people. So uh, if you want to find out more about what's happening in augmenting in, in augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, mixed reality. Uh, as I say, Google augmenting reality meetup and you'll see where we are. We meet uh, regularly at uh, Microsoft Reactor uh, in Shoreditch. So anybody's welcome. Uh, the meetups are totally free because we're trying to generate interest in immersive te technologies uh, and everything to do with that and whether that's AI uh, or haptics uh, we also include that as well so uh, everybody's welcome as I say that uh, um, uh, also you can look at uh, the work that Immerse UK and Digital Catapult are doing in this area to find out more about uh, what's happening and how fast this new technology is actually going to be accelerating over the next few years. Okay, thanks very much for, uh, for that, uh, Steve. Um, uh, and of course, hopefully, this is the only the first of, of a webinar on the subject of immersive technologies. And in a very real sense, uh, webinars provide um, some kind of an immersive experience that allows people to communicate uh, certainly over distances and to be able to share their knowledge and experience without moving from from, from their desk. So um, maybe as well as the physical events that um, you're running and 
you must always remember that uh, meeting people physically um, has a lot of advantages over meeting virtually. Uh, but uh, I think uh, virtual meeting, virtual conferences and webinars, uh, I think will be increasingly important in helping to um, uh, share understanding uh, and to further advance the uh, development in immersive technology. Uh, I'm going to move over to Rohit now uh, for the for the final uh, question before we go to Q&A. Um, and Rohit, what, what's your vision of the future uh, of immersive technologies and how do you think it's going to shape business and society in the future? Uh, it's quite a big question really. Um, I think what we're going to see is uh, a lot more of the the kind of applications that Steve and James in particular have been talking about, you know, fairly industrial applications, fairly operational applications, whether it's in training, uh, whether it's in maintenance. I think organizations are going to begin to see that this is actually an incredibly efficient way of doing things. And then scaling to the kind of applications, again, uh, we talked about like, architects meeting or engineers meeting and i think the current kind of coronavirus issue is going to accelerate that where people are saying Look, i can't travel i don't want my project to slow down i need to connect still with my partners and rather than all of us flying into dubai can we do this virtually can we and and you know yes we can do a video conference but if we can actually have the physical artifacts we're talking about or the room we're creating or the building we're building as a, as a place where, you know, that, that we can visit virtually, that changes it quite dramatically. I also think there's another thing that's going to benefit us here, which is that because of the coronavirus, a lot of organizations are going to see their environmental footprint decline quite dramatically. And that'll be monitored quite closely. And so they'll actually be saying, you know, how do we avoid going back to really stepping things up again? And that's where the technology starts to step in and says, you know, to say, actually, we can do a lot of what you would have done by flying using these virtual environments and you can reuse them and you can use them for training. So you're going to have multiple benefits from creating that virtual rendering of the building that you were built, uh, creating. I think... The, the area obviously that has the massive potential payoff is when you can bring this into next level gaming and you create true augmented virtual mixed reality gaming experiences, multiplayer experiences, experiences where individuals can start to also create part of the experience, almost home code and inject something in. That's when you start to get something really interesting, a whole new ecosystem emerging, potentially a new economic model as well about how all the players within that start to participate and get rewarded for adding stuff in. You might look at microgrids in electricity as one of the models that, you know, how that might work. But there are a lot of possibilities that come when you do this. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of people coming through who really don't want to travel anymore who want to be able to do everything virtually and who want the power that this technology gives them that you can't, you know, you, you can't give them those facilities any other way. So I think there's some very exciting applications there, both if you like in a work setting, but the really high potential one is when we start to bring this to the mass market and start to give people the ability to create their own elements of, of the experience. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, uh, Rohit. Um, as you say, it's a, it's a very exciting world that we uh, live in, um, and, I, and I have to reflect on the fact that many years ago I used to work for British Telecom, uh, and after I left British Telecom and went to uh, IBM, and this would be uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, and uh, video conferencing was going to be the big thing. Uh, and that was going to mean that none of us would uh, travel uh, anymore because we'd be able to communicate with each other uh, through video conferencing. And, and I still remember seeing loads of video conferencing equipment stacked away in cupboards unused many years later. Uh, but now, as we've got technologies like uh, 5G, we've got uh, truly immersive 
re virtual reality headsets, which don't have to be connected to a PC, improved communications, all of these enabling technologies will allow us to do so much more in the future and, and really raise the bar. I'm going to give each of um, our uh, panelists um, uh, an opportunity just to, to say a few final words in, in, in conclusion. Um, we have no open questions, so it looks like the questions have been dealt with. So, Ross, I'm going to start with you um, and just ask you to share your final thoughts. Um, yes, no, it's been a really interesting um, hour. Um, yeah, I, I think there is just, yeah, it's just so much, it is such a, a new, still a, a beginning point. I think it's, it's, it's almost quite similar to where smartphones were when they first came in. Is that I think you really couldn't see the potential of how they would become part of our daily life and where they would actually fit in. And um, I mean, I, I, I use my phone for so much, and it's it's kind of scary how much we depend on it. Um, I think the development will be something along that that line. It will become part of. We've come across it in business, in for um, entertainment, and yes, so many different points. Almost every uh, aspect of uh, of life, you might say. Uh, okay, James, what what would you uh, say in in conclusion? Just a few words. Um, I mean, I would say I, I don't think we're at the start of the journey. I think we're we're a little way through, and I think the market is waking up to the potential for immersive technology, particularly within the enterprise space. I think from a consumer perspective as well, they're starting to see where particularly sort of augmented reality, mixed reality can fit. I think virtual reality in the consumer space will stay pretty much in a gaming niche for, for a little bit of time yet. So I don't think we're going to have uh, headsets in every home for a reasonable amount of time until they become much uh, cheaper. And uh, I would say where we'll get to perhaps back to a point I think Rohit made is we'll have, you know, looking way ahead, we'll have one one headset which in effect is flips between VR and MR and uh, looks to a point where you're happy to wear it. But that's, you know, that's probably 20, 20 odd years off, but that's where we'll get to. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, James. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to conjure up some uh, images uh, of what that, that headset might, uh, might look like. Um, so now Rohit, um, as a futurist, uh, what would uh, what would you like to say about what can we look forward to in the future, as far as immersive technologies are concerned? I think a lot has been covered. In the immediate future, it would be fascinating to see what uh, the business impact of coronavirus is on people's budgets and whether declining budgets actually accelerates the use of immersive technologies in training applications because it works out cheaper than you know the other alternatives longer term um, really interested to see you know how we can bring the price down to take it to the commercial market and how do we how do we create the ability for people to create real-time immersive experiences themselves as they can do now with a video camera how do we get to that point where the technology or you know a simple example um, you remember that tunnel uh, problem in Thailand where the, the football team were trapped. You know, what if those divers going through could have had the ability to capture and create an entire VR experience for the other divers coming through of exactly what the tunnel system looked like and, you know, been able to train people far more in VR before they went through. That, you know, that might have speeded up the whole process. Uh, and, and allowed for, I mean, they still had a fantastic outcome, but I think, you know, in those kind of emergency situations as well, VR could start to play a much bigger role as the technology gets smarter and smarter. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, and Steve, uh, what would you like to uh, 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 say about uh, the future of AR and uh, uh, VR from your perspective? Well, I think everybody's actually sort of put uh, put things very eloquently. Um, I, I think that the uh, short term, the next five years, uh, AR and VR is going to become more and more widely used. Uh, it's a case of getting uh, better applications, but also the price points of uh, the headsets and the quality of the headsets, also the quality of the applications uh, will help. Uh, but in 10 years time, I think we'll look back 
back on this and exactly like we look back on smartphones now, it's a very good analogy, uh, that we we have forgotten what it was like not to not to have VR and we would have forgotten what it was like not to have AR as part of our lives uh, and if we're going to go really far into the future uh, the future of headsets uh, is actually probably going to be in, um, uh, in implants or uh, contact lenses uh, if you want to go real science fiction that's on the agenda uh, how soon that's going to happen it's anybody's guess but uh, it's certainly going to be very exciting times in immersive technology from now on okay thanks very much for that steve and thank you very much to um, all of our panelists uh, you've done a great job and i thank you for giving up your time this afternoon just in conclusion from uh, from my point of view um, i think a lot of people don't realize just how much you can already do with existing technology and I'd like to cite just a, a simple example. As, as I'm of pensionable age, I'm lucky enough to go to a, a local village hall for uh, lunch about once a month. Uh, and I, I gather together with uh, a lot of older people like myself. Uh, and on one occasion last year, uh, when I was asked to give a talk about my travels and about the kind of work that I do, um, I was using a 360 degree uh, uh, camera uh, in this village hall uh, connected to the internet with, uh, with the 4G and I said to my older companions uh, what would it be like if you could have one of your relations experience being sat in the same room as you and uh, listening to this presentation and sharing it with you and they said why it would be wonderful and i said well that's what's actually happening now because i was live streaming with a consumer 360 degree camera and we were actually being watched in brazil thailand lithuania as well as in the uk and that was 18 months ago so we are really not just at the not at the start of the journey but i think we are some way through it as james has said thank you very much for those of you have joined us today as participants and thank you very much to all our panelists and uh, I look forward to hopefully meeting you again um, in future I